Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Science Under the Dome. My name is Jeremy Osowski with Fisk Planetarium. Our facilitator this month is Joe Mahas Tate. Joe, take it away. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining Fisk Planetarium's virtual science, virtual science under the dome talk series. My name is Joe Mahas Tate, and I'm a graduate student at CU Boulder. I'll be your facilitator today. And Jeremy will be navigating our dome journey. Thanks, Jeremy. At Fisk, we want you to know that even away from the physical dome, we will continue to provide you with high quality online content until Fisk Planetarium reopens. So tonight's talk is the craziest creatures on earth, what the world's wackiest organisms can tell us about life in the cosmos. And you will hear about science and society, and of course, some sci-fi. If you have questions, please be sure to write them in the chat and let us know where you're listening from. At the end of the talk, we'll have time for some Q&A. And without further ado, I will introduce you to tonight's speaker, Dr. Graham Lau. Dr. Lau is an astrobiologist and communicator of science. His academic background is vast, from biology to chemistry, astrophysics, and geology, Dr. Lau is an expert on how living things affect the envir environment around them and the ways we search and imagine alien life beyond Earth. Dr. Lau has earned his doctorate from right here at CU Boulder, and he's currently the Director of Communications and Marketing for Blue Marble Space and a research investigator at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. He's a member of the Center for Life Detection through NASA Ames Research Center, the Director of Logistics for the University Rover Challenge, and my favorite, the host of Ask an Astrobiologist, also with NASA. You can tune in to his talks right here on YouTube. And honestly, you, you're gonna do just that after this talk because what you're about to hear will make you want to learn more about life beyond planet Earth. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lau. And thank you very much, Joe. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, this talk was originally developed for the planetarium. So it's really cool now to bring it to the YouTube audience, the, the 2D audience, still using the power of the planetarium to share some of this cool science and some of these cool ideas with us. And you know, we live in a really exceptional time right now. Within the last century, we discovered that other galaxies exist. This year marks the 60th year, six decades since the first human being went into space. And that sounds like a long time relative to our lives, but is a very short blink of the eye in the age of the cosmos and the age of the planet. And looking forward right now, it feels like if we are not alone in the cosmos, we must be very, very close to finding signs of life out there. With all of our missions being sent to other worlds, the great science that we're doing in the realm of astrobiology, all the things we're learning about new worlds beyond our own star system, uh, it just seems likely that if there is life, then we're going to find it. And if we do, what might that life be like? Could it be anything like what we've envisioned in our science fiction films and television shows and comic books and novels in our own minds dreaming of what aliens might be like? And a lot of our sci-fi has really had aliens be you know, very much like us. They've had two arms, two legs, eyes, two nostrils. And there's a good reason for that uh, from a production standpoint for science fiction, especially early sci-fi, it was a lot cheaper to have a person walking around in a, a chimpanzee or a gorilla suit, uh, pretending to be an alien uh, rather than going through a lot of makeup and costume design to create aliens. But we've gotten better and better at it, not only creating more alien humanoids, but also really alien creatures in a lot of our films like the Xenomorphs and Alien and the bug creatures from Starship Troopers uh, and even from Avatar, some of the creatures there. Some of these bizarre things we've thought of, but are they anything like what alien life might be like? And, and is there anything we can find here on Earth to help us imagine alien life? Uh, and I will argue there certainly is, not just for understanding what life is, but what it might even be like. For instance, we have a lot of really bizarre creatures here on the planet that look alien to us. 
Uh, these two right here, the Portuguese man of war and the deep sea giant isopod are both ocean creatures. The one on the left, the Portuguese man of war is an organism called a siphonophore. These organisms aren't like us. They're not full multicellular beings with each, each cell being built to do its own specific job, but not being able to live on its own. They're colonial organisms. They're made up of a bunch of different individual organisms that are coming together to do different jobs to create the larger creature, the large colonial being. These deep sea giant isopods are crustaceans. And you might have seen creatures like them in your backyard or maybe in a city park. Uh, where I come from in, in Pennsylvania, we called them roly poly bugs growing up. Uh, you probably had other names for them maybe as well, but these ones live down on the ocean floor and they grow very, very large up to a half a meter or about a foot and a half uh, in length. And they have these exoskeletons around them. They have seven pairs of segmented appendages uh, limbs to allow them to move around. And maybe alien life would be very like this, very much like a crustacean or an insect or an arachnid that we can find here on Earth. So maybe we can look at terrestrial organisms to think about what aliens might be like. We can also think a lot about how life functions here on Earth and what it does. Life's found a lot of unique ways over the billions of years of evolution that life has been around on this planet uh, to have organisms find their food, to bring in energy, for organisms to learn how to move through their environment in a variety of ways, for larger creatures and animals to swim and to fly and to walk, uh, various ways for plants and fungi to grow, and then for the, the myriad microbial species out there on the planet. They do so many things that we can look at. We can look at environments, see how life here on Earth has adapted to those environments and try to figure out what that could teach us about what could be out there. For instance, one of my favorite creatures to think about, especially when it comes to what might be on alien worlds, are trees. Trees aren't just you know, extremely beautiful creatures for us to walk beside uh, when we're out in the park or out in the woods or in the wilderness. They're not just remarkable organisms who stretch up high to compete, to get sunlight and to breathe in CO2 and breathe out oxygen for us to, to breathe in. They are literally organisms who have found a way to stretch as far as they possibly can towards starlight. They're trying their hardest to get starlight in their lives. And I find that beautiful. And it makes me wonder, could there be alien trees out there? And in our science fiction, we've imagined what some alien biospheres might be like. For instance, in the film Avatar that came out all the way back in 2009 now, uh, they envisioned a world in Pandora, this moon, this, this lunar world, where they created their, an entire biosphere for it that very much looked like the kinds of organisms we see here on Earth with their own little differences. Uh, they created their, their own animal-like creatures, their own plant-like and fungi-like creatures around this world. And one thing that I really loved in that film was the creation of a very large tree called Home Tree that you can see in this picture where they're looking at a display of home tree. Uh, here on earth, we do have some very large trees. For instance, in Redwood National Forest, the, the tallest tree that we know of is named Hyperion. It stands just over 380 feet tall. But in the film Avatar, this tree, home tree, was near to 500 feet in height. So much, much taller than the tallest tree we have here on earth. And in the film, they have organisms living inside of the tree. They have their own society of humanoid organisms inside the tree with myriad other creatures living in different regions going up through the various parts of the tree and up into its canopy. And that makes me wonder a lot about, could there be even larger trees or tree-like creatures on alien worlds? And what would they look like? How wide would they have to be? And how tall could they actually be? Here on Earth, our trees are limited really by gravity and by the biology of drawing water up through their trunks to get up to their leaves. And so maybe trees on alien worlds wouldn't require the same kinds of fluid. Maybe they wouldn't need water, or maybe they would have a, a smarter, better way to have adapted to draw their fluid up from the ground up to the top of the tree to allow them to grow even taller. It makes me wonder what that alien world could look like with some mega forest standing maybe thousands or heck, even tens of thousands of feet tall in the air. What kinds of aliens would live inside of such forests? Trees are also cool because of how they interact with the soil below. 
plants, when they, they bore their roots down into the soil, they interact with the soil, the subsurface. They break apart mineral grains. They have organisms thriving on them, microbes and fungi that thrive on the root systems that help the trees get their nutrients. There's a whole biosphere under the ground and root systems. And there's also a lot of organisms down there that are burrowing. And burrowing creatures are kind of cool here on our planet as well. Things like worms and, and other creatures that dig into the ground, they alter the landscape. And could this happen on an alien world? Could there be creatures out there altering their own landscapes on these alien worlds in unique uh, patterns and, and different ways? One of the creatures that we have right here in Colorado, that if you've ever gone for a hike in, in any of the front range areas here in Colorado, you've most likely seen these guys. Uh, these are prairie dogs. Uh, and I love, I love when I see them when I'm out hiking, they have huge burrow networks. And then every now and then you'll see one pop up and start squeaking at you, trying to warn you off and also protecting the rest of, of the families of, of prairie dogs down below. They create very unique, unique networks of burrows in the ground, burrows that used to then become inhabited by black-footed ferrets when they were still very common here uh, in Colorado and are, are now finally coming back to a lot of great work due to a lot of great work and reintroducing black-footed ferrets. Uh, but organisms like, like these prairie dogs are altering the landscape by creating this caved, holy tunnel network all throughout. And it's, it's obvious when you walk around and you're hiking near them, it's, it's very cool to see. And something I just learned about recently that now has me wondering a lot more about potential burrow systems and alien worlds is the occurrence of paleo burrows from other kinds of creatures. We can find burrows from worms and, and other organisms from millennia and, and eons ago uh, that have been preserved in the subsurface and in, in the rock for us to find. But these burrows I hadn't heard about before, very recently some scientists have been looking at these large cave structures and determined that there wasn't a very good uh, non-biological, a good geological reason for these caves to have formed. And then they started exploring them, they started finding claws, claw marks in the edges of these cave walls. And in this picture, I hope you can see the people in the back of this cave, it's a very large cave. Researchers now think these caves were formed by megafauna that lived thousands of years ago and are now extinct. Uh, things like a giant armadillo or maybe a giant ground sloth. This image is showing one of our modern tree sloths uh, compared to the size of some human children. Uh, and to give you an idea of how big a giant ground sloth was, this would be uh, an, an organism known as Lestodon, one of the giant ground sloths, it can weigh up to four tons and would have been humongous compared to us humans, uh, a real beast. And it could have dug those, those giant burrows that we now have preserved in places like the Amazon where you can go see some of those. Uh, and it makes me wonder, could there be alien worlds out there with giant mega creatures, uh, things like this giant ground sloth, or maybe even as big as the dinosaurs were, who are also creating burrows? So not only could there be alien worlds with giant trees reaching super high, there might be alien worlds with entire networks of tunnels and tubes running all in the, un in the underground area created by mega sized organisms. And so when we start thinking about some of these things that are possible based on what we know of life here, we have to consider the various ways that life has really become adapted to its environment. Life here on earth has had billions of years to find ways to adapt to all of these different environments around the planet, to the ocean, to dry land. Uh, once plants came around, we started having forests and savanna. Uh, and then once we had animals and fungi, things have changed so much over our planet over time to provide all of these different environments. And using the power of the planetarium right now, we can journey away from our planet and step out into our solar system and have a little thought about what other kinds of environments are possible. Our star system, we have a very average star in the sun, a G2 type star, uh, compared to the other stars that we know out there in the universe. We have eight planets, hundreds of dwarf planets, and then myriad comets and asteroids, lots of potential environments within even our own solar system to explore, to think about how life might inhabit some of these other types of environments that we have. For instance, when we look down here at the orbits of the worlds 
in our solar system and, and we think about what's available, one of my favorite worlds to talk about outside of the Earth is Venus. Venus is very much our sister planet. And I've often argued that if there was any place besides Earth in the early solar system that had life, it was most likely Venus. Venus could have very likely had oceans just like we do, an atmosphere like we do long ago. But things changed a lot on Venus over time. And if we look at Venus now, we see this world. We see a world obscured by clouds. Venus has a very thick and dense atmosphere. And when we look in visible light at Venus, all we can see is, is the cloud layers. But with science, we can actually look down through those cloud layers. For instance, we can use radar bouncing radio waves off of the surface of Venus and back at us to see the structure of the rocks on Venus. And so when we look at one of these types of radar images of Venus, what you're seeing are data where you see the, the, the brighter colored features on this world, you're seeing where the rocks are sharp and jagged, where you're seeing darker colored material, that's where the rocks are smoother because it's how the, the, the radio waves are interacting with the rock. And the data come back very much, we get a black and white image. This image was actually colorized based on real data taken from the surface of Venus by two landers from the Soviet Union, Venera 13 and Venera 14. Those landers did not survive very long. Uh, 127 minutes is the longest any instrument, any lander has survived on the surface of Venus and for a very good reason. The surface of Venus is a scorcher. It's extremely hot, something around 850 degrees Fahrenheit or 460 degrees Celsius. That's hot enough that you could cook one of those freezer pizzas in about eight seconds on the surface of Venus, but you'd be dead long before you had a chance to, to eat the thing. Uh, the surface pressure is also 92 times greater than what we have here at the surface of the Earth. So not only is it very dense, high pressure, very hot environment on Venus, it's telling us that chances are life as we know it can't thrive there. But it should at least tell us that there could be other worlds that are hothouses, worlds that are high temperature worlds compared to ours. What would life thriving on a very hot world look like, or at least in hot environments? Well, we have good examples of that here on Earth. For instance, in geothermal systems. This is a hot spring uh, called Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. This hot spring is my favorite that I've ever had a chance to visit. Uh, it's extremely beautiful to look at from above and, and from the side. Uh, in the middle, you're seeing this blue water that's around 190 degrees Fahrenheit when it reaches the surface of the hot spring. Uh, and when the water flows out to those edges, it's getting to about 145 degrees uh, Fahrenheit out towards the edges. Uh, and yet there are things thriving, surviving in this fluid along the edge of the pool. They're utilizing the chemistry in these hot fluids. And since it is so hot, none of the other kinds of organisms who would come and try to eat them uh, are there. And so all of that coloration that you're seeing, the, the greens and yellows, the, the reds, the oranges, those are all being caused by living things. Microbial organisms surviving in the edges of this hot spring give it this beautiful color that also gave it its name. Here's another image uh, looking on the side down towards Grand Prismatic. And what I love, uh, uh, these colorations uh, are caused by uh, photoprotective pigments that, that are preserving the organisms from being destroyed by sunlight, basically, uh, as, well as, as well as photosynthetic pigments that allow them to use sunlight for energy. And what's really cool is that th this spring actually changes color throughout the year based on the temperature and availability of sunlight around the spring. And so in the wintertime, you have more greens and in the summertime, it has more of the yellows and, and the oranges. And these creatures are a kind of creature that we refer to uh, all around the planet. We have organisms like this who thrive in environments that are extreme relative to us humans. And so we call these organisms extremophiles. And there are many different kinds of extremophiles, different kinds of extremes, high salt, high heat, very low temperature. Uh, for instance, this organism, Methanopyrus canleri, uh, is a microorganism that was first found on the seafloor uh, and has since been cultured and studied. This organism can thrive at, two, at over 250 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Uh, so extremely high temperature relative to the organisms who are thriving around the edges of Grand Prismatic Spring. And it can thrive at 20 megapascals of pressure, that 20 MPA uh, you see on, on this image here. Uh, to give you an idea of, of how much pressure that is, on the seafloor, uh, we have around 1,000 atmospheres or so on the deep seafloor of our oceans. That's around 10 to sometimes even up to 100 uh, megapascals. So 20 megapascals is, is very typical for the seafloor of our oceans. So these, these organisms can thrive in extremely high temperatures on the bottom of the ocean. And since they thrive in very high temperature and high pressure, we have names for them. Uh, for instance, they are hyperthermophiles. They thrive in high temperature. They're also known as barophiles. They thrive at high pressure. And we have various organisms like this all around our planet Earth, organisms that are extremophiles. And again, even though these guys can withstand very high temperature, they still couldn't withstand the temperature at the surface of Venus. Again, that's 850 degrees Fahrenheit is extremely, extremely hot at the surface of Venus. But you might have heard recently about some more recent research going on with the potential for life on Venus. For instance, just this past year, we had a paper uh, announced uh, that, that pr proposed the detection of a certain molecule in the higher, the middle atmosphere of Venus uh, called phosphine. Phosphine that you can see in this picture is a phosphorus atom surrounded by three hydrogen atoms. And the reason it'd be really, really cool if this molecule was discovered on Venus is because we don't have a good way to explain its presence there. On Earth, we, we can make phosphine in the laboratory. We can, we can produce phosphine for industrial reasons, but in the natural environment on the Earth, we, we do not find phosphine unless it's formed by life. So we find it in areas like marine sediments and swampy areas, landfills and fecal matter uh, and digesters that break down biomass. Uh, it's formed through the breakdown of organic material by, by life, by biological action. And so the, the potential for it to be on Venus to be formed by life could be good if it's there. However, we've also found phosphine in other worlds in our solar system. We, we've found it in Jupiter and Saturn, for instance. But the chemistry and the physics of where it's forming and how it could be forming on Jupiter and Saturn give us a very good non-biological uh, hypothesis, a working hypothesis for how it's being formed, that we don't require life. But on Venus, we don't have any good physical process that we know of that could form phosphine. And so if it is there, maybe it's being formed by something living, not down on that scorching surface, but up in the atmosphere. The same authors who published that paper showing a detection of phosphine have another paper that came out fairly recently proposing a possible life cycle of what might be happening in the atmosphere of Venus. So in, in this image, you see the elevation, the altitude above the surface of Venus, and you can see the rough temperature and pressure. And if you look in this middle temperate region, right in the middle of the cloud layer, the temperature gets, it's still pretty hot around 60 Celsius, but but it's still closer to what organisms here on earth can thrive in. And the pressure is around one bar, which is the same we have at sea level here on earth. And so maybe life as we know it could actually survive in some kind of life cycle. And so the authors even proposed what that, that, what that could look like. For instance, they proposed that there could be spores of organisms, not, not the live organism, but a spore that holds all of its genetic material, allowing it to come back to life when it goes into a favorable environment, which, which we're seeing in this image, where these spores are then going up into the middle cloud layer and they're collecting water around the outer edges of themselves, forming a little layer of water where they can then become vegetative and, and grow out. Uh, and then at the end of their life cycles, they can sporulate again and create a spore that might rain back down in the atmosphere. And this is really cool and very wild. And, and maybe it's possible. I, I mean, if phosphine's there and we might need life to explain it, that could be a, a, a potential life cycle for those creatures. But we always have to watch with science. You might not have heard there, there is still a very active debate about uh, whether or not we actually found phosphine. So the original data from, from last fall that was announced used two different telescopes, the, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope and ALMA, the, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. Uh, these two telescopes are, are looking in the radio region at Venus 
uh, for, for the collection of these data. And what they saw was this little dip in the data. First with James Clerk Maxwell, which you can see in the gray, and it doesn't look as good, but, but Alma has much better resolution. So they got even better data here showing that dip. And that dip they inferred to be from the absorption of phosphine, absorbing those radio waves uh, and causing that dip in this, the spectra. But since then, there's, there's been a very active scientific debate um, about whether or not that, that dip is actually phosphine. For instance, it's been proposed it could be actually caused by sulfur dioxide, uh, which really should be in the atmosphere of Venus. There's sulfuric acid in the atmosphere of Venus. There should be sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere of Venus. There's also been some other recent research proposing that these dips might not even be there. There might not be any absorption in this region at all. And so when we go out trying to use what we know of life here on earth and, and look at other environments and, and try to find out if there could be signs of life out there, we have to make sure that we're being rigorous in how we look at the data, how we collect the data, how we infer things from the data. And so it's, it's nice to always remind ourselves that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so in our, in our search for trying to understand if there could be life in our solar system, you might have most likely very recently heard of another place in which we are searching for some extraordinary evidence. Uh, just recently, we had a very new robot land on the surface of Mars. Uh, Mars has been a very large favorite world for a lot of people now for some time uh, in the potential of, of looking for, for life. Um, and this new robot that is now joining uh, many others before it on the surface of Mars uh, is known as Perseverance. Uh, some of us call it Percy. And we just have a little clip here from the video showing the landing of Perseverance on Mars. It's so cool watching that sky crane when it lowers the, the rover down and then flies away. It, just watching these videos for me as a sci-fi nerd, it feels like my sci-fi youth coming to life, uh, watching this sky crane fly away leaving the rover behind on the surface. Uh, of course, the folks at JPL gave us some really cool little Easter eggs as well. Uh, you know, Dare Mighty Things was written in the parachute in code. Um, you know, we have some really cool things on the rover. Perseverance is gonna do some really cool things. It is the very first thing we've sent to Mars since the Viking landers with the intention, with the, the, the actual language in the mission to say that we're looking for signs of life. Uh, in this image here, you can see this is showing the landing ellipse with where Perseverance is inside of that, inside of this region called Jezero Crater. Uh, I highly recommend you, you check out this website uh, from, from NASA. Uh, you're going to be able to watch and follow along with Perseverance as it makes its way through Jezero Crater and starts doing some really cool science. Uh, if we get really lucky, maybe, maybe they'll pop a separate little pin on this thing for ingenuity when it takes off and flies around. But the reason that we, we landed Perseverance in this region of Mars called Jezero Crater is because of the potential to find past signs of life here, or maybe even extant life. Uh, Jezero Crater appears to have been a paleo lake, once filled with water that long ago vanished, maybe in multiple periods. Uh, and not only that, but on the left-hand side of this picture, you can see where uh, an inflow channel carving its way into Jezero Crater, uh, brought material into the crater, into that Paleo Lake, and deposited it in a very large delta structure. So maybe that delta itself was a good place to capture the signs of life from that inflow channel in that lake uh, and bury them here for, for us to find now with Perseverance Rover. There's a lot of other things that we can look for on Mars, and, and we, we know that based on what we've been doing here on Earth, trying to compare Earth analogs to places on Mars like Jezero Crater and, and others. For instance, the reason Mars has that red coloration and we call it the red planet comes from the oxidation of iron, uh, the process that makes rust. So the rocks on the surface of Mars are rich in iron and they've rusted out basically, which is why we now see it kind of a brownish usually on the surface. But uh, when we look at it in the night sky with our eye, we see it very red uh, because of the way that the light is being scattered. And we have a lot of places here on Earth where we have very similar minerals to the things that we can find on Mars, those rusted out kinds of minerals. Places like Borp Fjord Pass in the Canadian High Arctic, the Rio Tinto River in Spain, they provide good test beds, good analogs for how life, microbial life primarily, uh, interacts with these iron rich minerals on our planet and what it could teach us about the potential for life on Mars. You might also know that 
we have another rover that's currently uh, active on Mars called Curiosity, uh, which has also been doing some incredible work and looking at sites that that we use analogs and, and how life reacts with, with the, the geology here on Earth uh, to try to understand what, what we could find on Mars that could be a sign of life. But the main reason for this talk that I wanted to bring up Curiosity was to talk about some data from one of the instruments on board Curiosity. That instrument is the Radiation Assessment Detector, or RAD. Very early on, uh, when the mission launched, they turned this instrument on and collected data on all the radiation uh, hitting the, the, the robot and the, the, the instrument on its way to Mars and, and on the surface of Mars. And that taught us something about, about the radiation environment on the surface of Mars. So for instance, this image here is, is a plot showing uh, in a logarithmic scale. So going from zero to 10, multiplying by 10 to 100, multiplying by 10 to 1,000. Uh, so this scale is quickly jumping up. Uh, the amount of radiation dose uh, so, for instance, this, is, this yellow bar is showing the average radiation dose uh, in, a milli, in a unit called millisieverts for a person here in the U.S. Uh, so, from all kinds of sources around us, there's radiation constantly hitting us, coming down from the atmosphere and coming up from the rocks below our feet. Uh, there's radiation in the food that we eat. It's all around us. But we've evolved in this environment with, with this, this level of radiation. Uh, but if we travel to other places, things get different. For instance, for a person spending six months in the ISS, they actually get a much larger dose of radiation. It's not enough to kill them and, and it's not as much as, as we would need to be worried about, but it's still a rather high dose compared to what we're actually getting uh, here on the ground in the US. But if we look at the, 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 in, the inf information from the radiation assessment detector on Mars, we see a much different story. There's a lot more radiation uh, that would happen to a human body on a mission to Mars, so say 500 days on Mars, that'd be a pretty large dose of radiation that we'd accumulate. And that's not good for us. Uh, we, we are not meant to handle those kinds of large doses of radiation, but there is a crazy creature on Earth who could easily handle that. Uh, this is called Dinococcus radiodurans, and it's one of my favorite crazy creatures, primarily because of its name. Uh, Dinococcus radiodurans means terrible berry who can withstand radiation. Uh, if you remember the, from, from like grade school, dinosaurs means terrible lizard, uh, even though they're not lizards. Uh, Dinococcus means terrible berry, and, and I, I love that terminology. But they're also extreme in that they can handle more radiation than any other organism that we know of. And so we call them the most radiation-resistant life form. They can handle about a thousand times the dose that we humans can take that would kill us, and they're still entirely fine. But you know, it wouldn't be a talk, you know, sharing things about weird creatures and extremophiles if I didn't also talk about tardigrades, at least for a moment. Uh, everyone loves tardigrades. Water bears are super cute, for one thing. Uh, plus, like, they're incredible. They're, they're all around our planet. They're very old genetically. Uh, and they're poly-extremophiles. They can stand a bunch of different kinds of extremes. Uh, tardigrades can survive very saline fluids. They can survive with almost no fluid at all. If you take all the water away from them, they basically dry down into a little clump of flesh. Uh, and if you put the water, give them the water again, they'll just kind of bump back up again. Uh, they can also withstand high radiation, not as high as Dinococcus radiodurans, but, but still about 800 times what we humans could, could actually take before we would die. Tardigrades are also uh, famous for being able to survive, uh, at least some of them for some time, in exposure experiments outside of the International Space Station. We've taken extremophiles like tardigrades and, and done these exposure experiments to see what the space environment does to these creatures, how they can actually survive being exposed to the vacuum, to the cold of space, to the radiation environment around the International Space Station. And this by itself makes me start wondering, what, you know, what can life out there really do? Could there be living things that are fine to live in space on their own? For instance, one of my favorite episodes of an older show called Star Trek The Next Generation is one where they, they meet a creature who itself is also a, a biological spaceship, uh, and this creature can freely move itself through space. So it, it's, found a, it's evolved a biological method to propel itself through space. And that might sound bizarre, especially for any astrophysicist or physicist watching, um, but you know, it's fun to imagine what's possible. 
You know, we, we're only limited by our imaginations and, and the, the knowledge that we have from the physics and the chemistry of life here on earth and, and what we think life could do out there. Of course, there's other great examples in science fiction. Uh, one of my favorite shows in sci-fi is The Expanse. Uh, I really loved book four as well as season four because it, it highlights an astrobiologist for one thing, uh, and two, they have a chance to explore the biology of an alien world. Uh, in this case, they, they meet an organism who gets into their eyes and starts basically using their eye fluid to survive, but it's also a photosynthesizer. And so it covers out their vision by, by becoming photosynthetic and blinds people. Uh, fortunately, one of the characters was on anti-cancer medicine and the scientist amongst them discovers that medicine can also protect them from this alien creature. Uh, a little far-fetched, sure, but it was still really cool to watch as an astrobiologist to see sci-fi trying to think about what life could do out there. And, and we've imagined this a lot in our science and our science fiction of just what's possible. For instance, could there be life in a gas giant like Jupiter or like Saturn? And this is a fun moment uh, because we have a little clip from the original show Cosmos featuring Carl Sagan, where he'll talk momentarily about uh, what's actually possible, what could be possible in a gas giant. Think of a world something like Jupiter, with an atmosphere rich in hydrogen, helium, methane, water, and ammonia, in which organic molecules might be falling from the skies like manna from heaven. Could there be life on such a world? Well, there's a special problem. The atmosphere is turbulent and down deep before we ever come to a surface, it's very hot. If you're not careful, you'll be carried down and fried. So one way to make a living is to reproduce before you're fried. Turbulence will carry some of your offspring to the higher and cooler layers. Such organisms could be very little. We call them sinkers. The physicist E.E. E. Saul Peter and I at Cornell have calculated something about the other kinds of life that might exist on such a world. Vast living balloons could stay buoyant by pumping heavy gases from their interiors or by keeping their insides warm. They might eat the organic molecules in the air or make their own with sunlight. We call these creatures floaters. We imagine floaters kilometers across, enormously larger than the greatest whale that ever was, beings the size of cities. We conceive of them arrayed in great lazy herds as far as the eye can see, concentrated in the updrafts in the enormous sea of clouds. But there can be other creatures in this alien environment, hunters. Hunters are fast and maneuverable, they eat the floaters, both for their organic molecules and for their store of pure hydrogen. But there can't be many hunters, because if they destroy all the floaters, they themselves will perish. Physics and chemistry permit such life forms. Art presents them with a certain reality. But nature is not obliged to follow our speculations. However, if there are billions of inhabited worlds in the Milky Way galaxy, then I think it's likely that there are a few places which might have hunters and floaters and sinkers. Biology is more like history than it is like physics. You have to know the past to understand the present. There's no predictive theory of biology, just as there's no predictive theory of history. The reason is the same. Both subjects are still too complicated for us. But we can understand ourselves much better by understanding other cases. The study of a single instance of extraterrestrial life, no matter how humble a, a microbe would be just fine, will de-provincialize biology. It will show us what else is possible. We've heard so far the voice of life on only a single world. But for the first time, as we shall see, we've begun a serious scientific search for the cosmic fugue. We are only limited by by the chemistry, the physics of what we know. We, we have no universal law of life yet, 
there's still a lot that we're exploring based on the knowledge we've acquired already. And there's still so much more knowledge to acquire to help us to bring in life and consciousness and some of these other realms. It's so beautiful to think about what's possible out there. For instance, if we step now to another world of our solar system, uh, one of my favorites, Europa. Uh, Europa is a moon of Jupiter, one of the, the first four moons discovered outside of our own moon uh, by Galileo. When, when he pointed his telescope to the sky, he discovered four moons orbiting Jupiter, and they were the first four uh, we, we, we found orbiting other worlds. Europa is about the same size as our moon. It's a very large moon, and it has this beautiful icy crust overlain with a bunch of cracks inside of the, the, the crust, these linea. Uh, and you can see kind of the coloration here, of this salty looking material inside of this ice on the surface of this world. Europa has become a, uh, a huge target in astrobiology because of what's down below that ice. We currently have good reason to think the ice on Europa might be something like 10 kilometers in thickness, maybe six miles. And then down below that, we have very good data to suggest there's a very, very deep ocean, maybe 100 or 120 kilometers in depth down below that icy crust. That's a lot of water. That's more water than we have in all of our oceans and lakes and rivers here on Earth. And so what's, what's possible? Using our knowledge of chemistry and physics, what we know of life here on Earth and, and what we can imagine, is it possible there could be some life thriving in that ocean of Europa? Maybe even down where the water meets the seafloor, there might be regions just like we have here on Earth with some other crazy creatures that thrive in hydrothermal vent systems. Here on our ocean floor, we discovered in 1977 and have been studying since then, where seawater infiltrates down through the oceanic crust. It's warmed up by the hot mantle down below and comes back out of the crust. And when it comes out, it's extremely hot, and it brings along with it a different kind of mineralogy, a lot of different elements and chemicals uh, that create these black smoker chimneys, but they also provide an oasis for life, a, a high temperature in the cold ocean, and a lot of chemistry to thrive on. And there are myriad creatures who have made these oases their home. One of the coolest might be Riftia pachyptala, or the giant tube worms that thrive in these regions around hydrothermal vents. They actually rely on microbes surviving inside of them to help them uh, get their food. They don't actually have a stomach. They use symbiosis with microbes to derive their food source. And there are lots of cool creatures in the bottom of the ocean, things like anglerfish and bioluminescent organisms. I mean, all the organisms in coral reefs are incredible. There's just so many cool things to see in the ocean. But another really cool one to think about is the blobfish. These are fish that survive primarily off the coast of Australia, uh, Tasmania, New Zealand. Uh, they live deep down in the ocean, so deep in the ocean that the, the regular way the, that most fish closer to the surface will use to control their, their buoyancy in the water, they'll use gas bladders, basically sacks they can fill with air, but blobfish can't do that since they're so deep. And so instead they have a gelatinous flesh that allows them to kind of infiltrate that flesh in different ways with fluid to allow them to change where they are in the water column. But if we bring them up out of the water column, they look a lot different. In 2013, they were voted the world's ugliest organism and people still make fun of them and, and use them in memes and all kinds of things on the internet, which is really, really unfair because in their normal environment down the seafloor, they are beautiful fish. It's only when we bring them to the surface out of the environment they've adapted for that they're ugly. It's like putting a human on a roller coaster and watching their cheeks fly back in the wind and catching a picture of it and then looking at that and saying, that's an ugly creature, but that's not our environment. We don't regularly move that fast through the air. I thought I'd toss this in for fun. Uh, someone with a, a large beard like myself trying to do a skydiving, for instance, that's also not my natural habitat flying through the air at 120 miles per hour. And so my beard would lift up over my eyes. It's long enough for that now. And so we are adapted to our environments. The blobfish is adapted to the seafloor. Life on Earth has adapted to various kinds of environments that we have around the seafloor. Arctic tundra, deep lakes, craters that have filled in over time, mountain ranges and deserts, forests and savannas, the ocean floor, the ocean surface, up in the atmosphere and deep under the ground. 
life has found many different ways to thrive in all of these different environments to use the environment for itself. And, you know, looking at our own solar system, we have places like Venus and, and Mars and Europa, a lot of other environments, but it should also make us wonder what kinds of environments might be out there in worlds and other star systems. So here using the power of the planetarium, we can travel outside of our star system to another one to see an alien world. When I was a kid, we did not yet know for sure that there were other planets out there. It wasn't until 1995 that the first planet around a main sequence star was discovered. And in these last 26 years, we've now found over 4,400 confirmed exoplanets. So many of these worlds out there that make us wonder what's possible. We found worlds that are hot Jupiters, giant Jupiter-sized worlds, orbiting so close to their stars that in days they whip the whole way around the star and come back around again. We're now discovering a lot more worlds closer in size to Neptune and even to the Earth. And it makes us wonder, do we know what to expect? Could there be so many weird different alien environments out there that allow for alien life to evolve in all kinds of new ways? And I should mention the image that you're seeing here, uh, this is not a real image of an exoplanet. We don't have images this good uh, of exoplanets yet. Uh, hopefully we will someday. Uh, this is a recreation of what an exoplanet could look like. And again, you know, using the laws of, of chemistry and of physics and our knowledge of what life is doing, we can kind of start to think about what's possible on these alien worlds, not just in how life adapts to its environment and what it might look like, but maybe also how it uses its sensory perception. For instance, one of the things I think they really messed up in Star Trek with the characters of the Ferengi, they gave them these beautiful humongous ears, but then they didn't give them that much better hearing. There's only a few episodes where they talk about the Ferengi hearing really well, but still with, with you know, if they're gonna make creatures who have great hearing, they should go all the way and maybe model it after something like the greater wax moth here on earth. This is another one of my very favorite weird creatures thriving on our planet. And it's because it has the greatest known range of hearing. The way that our hearing works, there's vibrations. If I clap my hands, as I hit my hands together, I'm causing vibrations in the air to go rippling off away from my hands. And when that ripple hits my ear, those vibrations are impacting my ear and and we've evolved hearing apparatus for, for changing those vibrations in the air into what our brains perceive as our hearing. But a lot of organisms hear in, in different ways around the planet. For instance, some organisms don't hear very many different kinds of waves at all. Uh, bullfrogs, for instance, only hear a very small number of wave ranges. Uh, parakeets and, and even us humans, we don't actually hear that well. We hear from about five, maybe out to about 20,000 Hertz. Uh, that's a, a, a hertz is a wave per second. So five to 20,000 waves per second hitting our ears. But of course, you know that if you have a dog at home, your dog hears a lot better than you do. Uh, and my dogs, for instance, they could be out in the yard playing and I could just sneak into the kitchen and grab a treat and they'll hear that noise and come running. But some other organisms on our planet hear even better. For instance, things using echolocation, things like dolphins and bats, but even they don't have a range of hearing close to the greater wax moth. But the main reason I, I like talking about the greater wax moth isn't just its huge range of hearing, but it's because of what it's hearing. Again, I mentioned we humans hear maybe five, most people are like 20-ish, out to 20,000 hertz, but the greater wax moth is hearing something like 50,000 to 300,000 waves per second hitting its ear. That means that the greater wax moth is not hearing the things that we hear and vice versa. We cannot know what it's like for the greater wax moth to hear these sounds in these very, very high frequencies. They hear so far out that some airport beacons that are transmitting uh, and weather relays are actually transmitting in a range that the greater wax moth could hear that sound. And that just seems bizarre. We have aliens here on earth, uh, at least with alien hearing. And here's another rather alien creature the mantis shrimp. Uh, you might have heard that they have amazing vision, amazing color vision. 
Uh, we humans, we see colors in red, green, and blue uh, using very specific cells in our eyes, our cones, that allow us to see those three colors and then mix them together to make our rainbow. Your dog at home only sees two colors and they can still see pretty well, but the mantis shrimp has between 12 and 16 color receptors. They're seeing in our visible light range as well as out into infrared and ultraviolet light. It's such a huge range of light they can see that Matthew Inman, writing in the comic The Oatmeal, has said that their vision is like having a th thermonuclear bomb of light and beauty going off in their eyes. But what's maybe even cooler to think about is more recently, some research has shown that not only do they see in those 12-ish uh, colors, but they're not actually blending them together into a rainbow the way we are. We blend our red, green, and blue together and, and make our visible spectrum the mantis shrimp is seeing all of these colors separately, which is utterly alien to how our sense perception of sight works. And so thinking about things that the greater wax moth and the mantis shrimp, they make me wonder if there are alien worlds out there that have life on them, what kinds of senses are they using? Are they using hearing and, and sight like we do? but are they utterly different? Are they, are they seeing entirely different ranges of light and hearing much different things? How are they actually perceiving these things? It makes me wonder a lot about what's possible. And I wanna finish off my talk with this image, a picture of the blue marble. Uh, this is a picture of our world taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts in 1972 as they were traveling to the moon. Uh, as an astrobiologist, I'm wondering all the time what's possible out there, but it's always important to remember, too, that we know about life and we know about our place in the universe by all that we've done here and all we've discovered. And again, it's only been 60 years since people first stepped foot into space. We have a huge future ahead of us, maybe discovering, thanks to some crazy creatures, what alien life out there might actually be like. Uh, and so I think with that, I will wrap it up for right now. Um, and now my, my, my toddler's actually crying in the background, so the timing is perfect. Dr. Lau, thank you so much. I am so excited to learn more about all the possibilities that could be out there. And I'm going to take advantage of being the facilitator tonight, and I'm going to drop your first question, if that's okay. So you talked about trees and their beauty and they're doing photosynthesis and reaching for the stars, right? And you also talked about Riftia and how they're doing a different process for energy, right? So chemosynthesis through their symbiosis with specific bacteria. Would you expect or could you imagine like different kinds of symbiosis in different planets? And what would they look like? Oh, absolutely. It's a fun question. And actually, I, I want to take that one back to Avatar, uh, the movie. One thing I, I really loved in Avatar, uh, and again, like, you know, we, we didn't even talk about consciousness at all, but, but one thing I loved in that film uh, was that the organisms on this planet have a really unique symbiosis. Uh, they're able to connect their, 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 their parts of their bodies that allow them to experience the world. Uh, so they're, they're neurosystems. Uh, they're, they're connecting themselves to these long things. And in, in the movie, you see it like the long braids coming out of the, the, the humanoid yeah. character's hair. Uh, and they connect it to, you know, other creatures. And they, they are then perceiving along with those creatures. And I, I love that thought. When that movie came out, you know, I, I was mind blown as an astrobiologist and a sci-fi geek. But that part, I think, might have been my favorite part of the whole film. This idea that there could be a symbiosis of perception where we would share mm -hmm. perception. Because imagine, you know, you know, sharing that perception with a mantis shrimp or a greater wax moth. It wouldn't need to be alien because we could actually sense it together. Uh, I love that idea. But when it comes to like the basic ways that life functions, life on our planet, there are lots of examples of symbioses in various kinds of ways where organisms are using other organisms, sometimes favorably, sometimes not, um, mm -hmm. to get their energy, to get their food. Uh, and so I think it seems based on life as we know it, that we're going to find alien symbioses out there as well. So cool. And we have so many great questions in the chat. And the, there are two questions that I'm going to combine. So that it becomes like this huge, gigantic thing. So 
one, one person asked about the uh, biochemical limit of extremophiles. So we often see them being microscopic, right? So it, is that something that plays a role it, within uh, being an extremophile? If so, if we shrunk to their level, would we be less susceptible to radiation? <laughs> oh, that's, really, that's a really fun question. <laughs> I've never had it proposed that way before. I've had variants of this, of the, of this question. Um, I, I want to do it in, in, in two parts. Um, uh, first off, being an extremophile, uh, as I mentioned, we call them extremophiles because of us. Um, we do have this habit, being human, of anthropocentrizing or anthropomorphizing every single thing that we see in the universe around us. Uh, and so when we say extremophile, we, we really are saying extreme relative to us. Now, granted, some of them are really thriving in the extremes of, of the physics and chemistry that we know of, of life on Earth. But we humans might also be considered extremophiles. Uh, for the first you know, billion years, maybe billion and a half years of life on Earth, organisms were not breathing oxygen. There wasn't oxygen in the atmosphere. And so an oxygen breather like us like what we are, would be considered an extremophile relative to that kind of life that existed early on in our planet. Uh, but when it comes to looking at the very far extremes of what's possible for life, I mean, we're still learning what's, what's possible out there. There are great hypotheses for maybe a temperature limit before the organic kind of molecules that life as we know it uses will automatically just start breaking down. So there is a point where we can't get to that temperature of Venus because things will just basically cook. Um, and, you know, when it comes to cold, there are lots of organisms that can survive extreme cold and then be warmed back up and, and they're fine. Uh, there's lots of other extremes. Um, I love this idea of shrinking us down. Um, it reminds me of the older film. I might get the name wrong. I think it was called Fantastic Voyage. I haven't seen it in maybe three decades. Um, but it's a very old film uh, where humans shrink themselves down to like the size of cells and go into a human body. Um, maybe some of our younger audience has seen more recent episodes of like Rick and Morty and some other shows where they, they basically spoof this, this older movie. Um, it's a cool thing to think about. Could we actually shrink ourselves, ourselves down like that? Um, but the thing is, we would still be human um, and we, you know, we don't have good physics to understand what that would be like. But th things like tardigrades and Dinococcus radiodurans, the way that they're surviving that radiation, it's not just because of their size. Uh, there's a lot of things they're doing biologically that are protecting them. Uh, for instance, Dinococcus radiodurans has four sets of its DNA, uh, whereas we only have two. Uh, and they also have these structures around them that help them to basically block some of that radiation. So they have multiple extra sets of DNA. They're blocking themselves, shielding themselves from radiation. Uh, so the better example of how we humans can make ourselves uh, less susceptible is by wearing you know, a space suit or, or some kind of lead shielding to block the radiation from us, uh, or it'd be like developing the, the necessary scientific medicine uh, to replace our organs and things like that, to have duplicates. Uh, and backups to, to save ourselves when things break down. Uh, that'd be the better way to go about making ourselves radiation resistant like those organisms. Wow. Yeah, that, that was an epic answer. And I'm so glad someone put that question in the chat. Um, we have time for one more question. And you didn't say it throughout your talk, but someone asked, what's your favorite wacky creature? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I actually, so, the, so I've given this talk a few times before and there is another creature. I'm not going to show the image, um, but it's one that I love to talk about because I've seen them sleeping. I've seen them flying. Uh, I've seen them resting. Uh, I, I love these creatures. They're hummingbirds. Uh, there are over 300 species of known hummingbird on the planet. Uh, the smallest one it weighs less than a paperclip. They're, they're, they can be very, very small. Uh, hummingbirds are... If you go to the gym and you see like one of those people who just like is doing nothing but the bench press in the bird world, that would be the hummingbird. Uh, about 25%, about one quarter of the hummingbird's dry mass is chest muscle. And so the hummingbird would be like skipping leg day every week, but doing, doing chest day all the time. Uh, and the reason for that, they, they can beat their wings at a remarkable speed. Uh, they can flutter, they can go up and down, left and right, front, they can, they can fly upside down and they can fly backwards uh, because they're moving their wings so fast. To do that, they have to beat their hearts extremely quickly 
which means they also have to have a lot of energy, a lot of calories. They have to take in a lot of food uh, to compare uh, the caloric intake by their body weight for a hummingbird to a human, uh, you're looking at something at the max range is around 70 to 80 times the caloric intake that we have. Uh, so to give you an idea of what that's like, some of the largest cheeseburgers in the planet, uh, there's one of them called the Belly Buster from this place in Pennsylvania called Dave's Beer Belly Pub. Uh, this cheeseburger is 25,000 calories. It weighs 20 pounds. If you were a hummingbird, on that far end of the caloric intake scale, you'd have to eat six of those cheeseburgers every day to stay alive, and you might still be hungry. And that to me is bizarre. Uh, it's like some of the giant whales out in the ocean just taking in humongous amounts of krill and, and eating other organisms. Some of the things that life on earth does to get food is remarkable. Um, but there's a lot of ways that, that life does cool things. And so I think I love hummingbirds the most personally, but and uh, I nerd out in just about anything when it comes to life on earth. Such a great answer. And I had no idea about the comparison between that burger and thinking about hummingbirds and how I would still be hungry. Just incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Lau, just so much appreciation for your time and for coming here and talking to us today. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Lau, you have all these different ways that you can reach him. But if you pop, continue popping questions in the chat, we'll make sure he will get them. So for CU students joining us today, you can learn more about Science Under the Dome and how you can get involved on CU's Buff Connect site, or you can shoot us an email at scienceunderthedome at colorado.edu. Our next talk is a Crowded Orbit, the Co-Evolution of Satellites and Space Junk with our own Jimmy Negus on April 15th at 7 p.m. I hope to see you all there. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau. Thank you, Jeremy. I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you, everybody, so much. See you next time. Bye, all.